The session will discuss the digital practitioner's body of knowledge and how it's relevant to innovation practice building out new digital products at Nationwide. Gentlemen, welcome. So I'll kick off. Hopefully everybody can hear me. Phil, give me a thumbs up, making sure. Perfect. All right. So uh, I welcome everybody to uh, tomorrow's Tech Today, as we like to call it at Nationwide. We run an internal podcast where we uh, talk about different things going on in the innovation space and the emerging technology space. Because of that, we run a little bit different format than maybe what you're used to. Uh, it's more of a conversational format. We'll have a, a deck that, that is presented. Michael will walk through that and Phil. But during the presentation, we'll kind of just jump in almost interview style as Phil is, is talking through things to give a little, you know, makes it a little more entertaining, I think. So today we'll be, you know, discussing our scaling digital products by leveraging uh, the, the PB Bach. And uh, first, I'd like to introduce myself, Paul Gilmore, and my co-host, Mike Fulton. Mike and I lead the technology innovation team here at Nationwide. And, uh, and today we're really focusing on a new kind of digital product. And we're going to have Phil jump in here in a little bit here to discuss kind of his journey uh, on the new digital, bringing a new digital product to life at Nationwide. It's a lot different uh, process and procedure than we've done in the past. And uh, I think I think it really uh, kind of keep good conversation going. Really, uh, it's a great lead in on, the previous conversation was a great lead into this on how we, how we build these things out. Uh, with that, I'm gonna jump over to Mike, let Mike kind of kick off uh, a little bit of uh, context setting. And then Phil will go into a little bit of detail about uh, the product we built called Nimble. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Paul. Um, I am looking uh, to someone from the Open Group to to help me with the slides here. I'm not seeing a way to navigate through those. Actually, there I found it. Uh, so as Paul was mentioning, um, we are uh, going to be talking a little bit today about our journey with Nimble. Uh, a nationwide digital product that was launched in uh, December. Uh, but to give you a little bit of context setting, uh, Paul asked me to just talk about some of the basic concepts that we're going to be leveraging in the conversation today. You may, if you've been with us uh, for the morning uh, or afternoon as it may be, or evening, depending on where you are in the world, uh, you may have seen a little bit about some of these different concepts already. But we know that people are coming in and out, and some of the folks are joining just for this conversation. So we want to make sure that we give you uh, all a little bit of information uh, to, to set the stage. So the first thing we want to talk about that's an important concept for our journey today is IT for IT and this particular picture. Uh, this particular picture is um, a level one reference architecture view. Basically, as you think about your IT tool chain uh, and all of the different uh, systems that you might need uh, to, to run an IT function, uh, we view this as a blueprint. Uh, it's a blueprint for your IT function. It's a blueprint for supporting the digital enterprise and for standing up the digital product. Um, when we uh, go through uh, the conversation today, we'll be leveraging IT for IT so uh, again, the, um, the slide that we're talking about is uh, that level one reference architecture for, uh, for the IT function, and this will be uh, the basis of our conversation today. We're also going to talk a little bit about the digital practitioner's body of knowledge and specifically uh, the emergence model. If you were here in our last presentation, uh, Dave talked a little bit about uh, digital practitioners and he talked a little bit about this concept of emergence, how uh, the, the body of knowledge is structured into these competency areas uh, that start with the founder level, um, emerge into what you need to know to, to work in a team, then expand out to what you need to know to manage a team of teams, and then how do you uh, really leverage the body of knowledge across an enduring enterprise. And so we're going to take you on that journey today uh, with Nimble and how we uh, leveraged this uh, construct for our digital product that we built within Nationwide. 
And what you'll see as we go through the discussion is there's a clear mapping between that digital enterprise blueprint, the IT for IT level one reference architecture, and each of those stages of uh, emergence from digital practitioners. This blueprint uh, mapping and the emergence of our IT tool chain is what we're specifically going to be talking about today. But I don't want to give away all the stories, so let's keep, uh, let's keep going on and uh, transition this over to Phil, who's going to talk a little bit about the Nimble story. Thanks, Mike. Um, hopefully you guys can hear me okay. Give me a thumbs up. Gotcha. Great, thank you. Uh, well, thanks. Uh, I'm excited to be here and talk a little bit about Nimble, tell the Nimble story. Um, so uh, this is the uh, high-level organizational context with how we approach uh, innovation at Nationwide, and we do so from three different lenses. Uh, we talk about the desirability lens, the feasibility lens, and the viability lens. Um, and primarily, you start uh, in the Nationwide way um, with a design thinking approach focused on desirability. Uh, the thought there is that if you don't have a strong unmet need in the marketplace, then sort of the feasibility, can we solve it, and the viability, can we build a business behind this, it just doesn't matter. Um, so early in the innovation process, we start with the lens of customer desirability. Uh, the other thing to, to note very quickly here, many on this call uh, will be familiar with the minimum viable product. Uh, I, you know, we do implement Agile and Scrum, uh, so MVP is a big part of that. Uh, we've uh, modified that a little bit to make it a minimally awesome product. Uh, the thought is that we want to deliver things quickly, uh, but we want to inject a little bit of customer delight. Um, so our goal is to create products that customers uh, didn't know they needed, but once they have them, they can't live without them. And the way we do that quickly is with minimally awesome products instead of minimally viable products. All right. This is a, uh, a high-level view of the... Um, well, actually, this is a slightly less high level than the last slide, but this is still relatively high level uh, for our corporate innovation process nationwide, uh, how we think about launching ideas from the ground up and scaling to an actual business that's generating revenue at scale. Uh, our goal is to do this a lot of different times with a lot of different concepts. Um, and I, you know, I, I don't think it's appropriate for the conversation here for me to go through this in any kind of uh, excruciating detail, and many of you will be happy with that. But uh, to relate this back to the digital practitioner body of knowledge, and the IT for IT um, framework. Uh, that's kind of why we bring this here. Um, when we talk about uh, what I just described as desirability, viability, and feasibility, uh, when you look at, um, and I don't know, can people see my cursor here? Uh, no, we can't. Okay, that's all right. So um, down the left side of the slide where you see team, stage, phase, duration, and pod size, I'm gonna be talking to the phase uh, row there. So, um, we start out trying to find unmet needs in the market with Explore. We move into conceptual design and then detailed design. And the idea there is that we aren't yet writing code for launching. Uh, we are creating high fidelity working prototypes and we're doing so uh, using sort of minimum technology uh, required to answer questions so that we can learn. Um, and that's really where the founder context comes into play for us. Uh, we have we are writing code, so some of the some of the basics of the founder context, uh, infrastructure, configuration management, et cetera, is required. Uh, but beyond that, um, it, these are largely again working prototypes that are intended to be you know answer a question, test a hypothesis, and then potentially be thrown out. Um, the uh, the other thing to say here is that uh, in Nimble's case, we had worked. Uh, for probably six months, uh, just exploring unmet needs in market with customers, trying to uh, do ethnographic research and understand what people needed and what people didn't have in their life. Um, and uh, that's really, we did that with low fidelity prototypes, click through prototypes using images and, and uh, sketch, et cetera, uh, before we wrote one line of code. Um, so uh, that's, uh, that's really, um, I guess the takeaway here is that founder context for us was applicable for uh, just working prototypes um, and code that was largely going to be uh, testing hypotheses and then uh, tossed out when we were done. So once we so so Phil, yeah, what like, you're saying there is that you you were actually potentially throwing this code away. Is that right? 
Yeah, and in a lot of cases, um, you know, the the process of exploring and understanding needs that aren't uh, well understood, uh, people unfortunately <laughs> didn't make our jobs easier. But people can't just tell you, here are all the needs I have in my life that I don't uh, that aren't filled. And if you could find a way to fill them, that would be great. Um, the uh, what we would do is often put prototypes in front of people and assess how how much they either light up or don't uh, when you see those prototypes and uh, the assessment of that need is directly related in, in many cases to how much the person seems to enjoy that prototype and talk about, oh man, I would love this thing or I'd, I'd be willing to even pay for this. Uh, then you know you've found a strong need. Uh, but yeah, again, it's it's testing to learn, not testing to actually build something. So to your point, yeah, those, those uh, assets are often just thrown away. And that seems a little counterintuitive, doesn't it, Paul, to how we typically build systems at Nationwide? I mean, throwing away code? Absolutely, it does. But what we found here is it really a lot. A lot of the code, some of them are POCs. If we have to hit certain APIs and stuff that we may reuse, reuse, but a lot of it is throwaway. But the value we get is we really help develop a, a tighter set of requirements. So even though the throw uh, some of the code may be throwaway, the learnings that we get and the requirements that we pull from it can help accelerate the build in the next phase. Great, thanks. Yeah, absolutely. The other thing, the other benefit to these uh, working prototypes that are often thrown away is it just um, it, it indicates the speed with which IT can run when we aren't being constrained, I'll say, by um, some of the necessary components that you bring to bear when you're launching enterprise systems. Um, so uh, I think that's an interesting, that's been an interesting takeaway for, uh, you know, for my business partners within, the, for our business partners within the innovation space. Yeah, and real quick, Phil, also realize we're talking, you know, in some cases, days, in some cases, you know, a couple of weeks. This isn't, you know, big, big project work here, big development work. Right. So um, as you proceed in our innovation process, you, we bundle up all of these learnings and then we present them. Uh, you can kind of see it to the right of the founder bubble in something called an innovation case to a funding body. It basically, uh, if you think of it as a shark tank, like, um, presentation, here are the things that we've learned in market when we've uh, traversed through our explore and design phase. Now we would love to have some funding and we would love to go and try to build this thing and see if we can actually create a business to, uh, to uh, launch in market. Uh, and so with that, we really start uh, having to organize more deliberately in this team context. Uh, we, in the case of Nimble, we chose to bring this to market in partnership with uh, a couple different teams uh, that are geographically dispersed. So we had some uh, complexity there in terms of managing uh, the actual delivery on a day-to-day -day basis and uh, remote collaboration. We did use Agile, of course. I know there's an assumption of Agile here. Uh, we did execute with Agile and Scrum. Uh, Nationwide's been using Agile for many years. Um, and, uh, and so, um, yeah, this is really, where we start to bring in some of the key principles of uh, sort of traditional software development. Uh, this code is not intended to be thrown away. A lot of the infrastructure we're standing up is uh, going to be intended to be used in production once we launch. Um, and in our case with Nimble, there's a very, very, very tight timeline where we were uh, hoping to uh, launch in a less than six months or so, uh, a digital product from concept to live in market. So that that's pretty. Uh, that felt pretty aggressive from a nationwide perspective, but uh, with the kind of work we were doing, I think it's it's aggressive um, in lots of different contexts. And one thing on this, on in the team concept, real quick, Phil. Yep. We we try to keep these teams lightweight. We have process, and we have to follow process. But in certain cases, we try to keep those things as lightweight as possible. We don't want to overspend and overbuild on something that once we get into what we call the incubate phase here, we may determine that, you know what, maybe this isn't gonna cut it, we gotta throw it away. Uh, and we worry about adding, you know, some more heft in the scale section. Sorry, Phil, go ahead. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Appreciate that, Paul. And so uh, as, we, uh, as we scale our development team to try to uh, launch this thing on time, uh, then team of teams context becomes even more applicable for us. And uh, the, the one thing I would say is that Throughout this process, um, I, I was not familiar with the digital practitioner body of knowledge. 
it's only in retrospect that we look back and, and sort of sought to overlay founder team and team of teams. Um, but I'll tell you what this has done for us is um, it gives us an interesting capability mapping that we can use to talk about the work we're doing in a way that uh, puts some of our enterprise partners at ease. Um, there are a lot of folks in Nationwide that know how well to deliver digital products, um, maybe in different ways than what we're trying to accomplish here in innovation, but there's plenty of knowledge and, and uh, experience in digital product delivery at Nationwide and an IT organization of you know, more than 7,000 people. So when somebody comes to the table and says, well, what are, how are you approaching defect management or how are you doing this or that? Um, you know, again, retrospectively, it would have been nice for us to be able to have this uh, founder team and team of teams capability mappings that IT for IT provides and be able to sort of walk people through. Yeah, we know that's a thing. That's not a thing right now for us. Um, so uh, something that we'll definitely take forward in our innovation efforts. Great. So we've been talking a little bit about Nimble. Um, I would love to take just a moment to introduce it to you. Uh, Nimble is a digital product, um, the first of its kind for Nationwide that is direct to consumer and was launched uh, in December of this past year. Uh, I would love for uh, my friends on this call um, to download this application, uh, e either from Google Play or the Apple iTunes App Store. And uh, if you love it, Talk about that in the App Store. If you don't love it so much, feel free to give us an email. Um, <laughs> but uh, the idea here is that Nimble is built uh, around the strong unmet need of helping our users get out of debt and stay out of debt uh, with some course correction along the way and spend guidance. Uh, really the big unmet need we had here was uh, people understand the uh, conventional knowledge that I should spend within my means, right? People know that. People know that they should have a budget. Uh, these things aren't particularly helpful for people that are struggling with debt day to day. What they really, uh, what we found that they really needed in talking with more than 100 people in the field, as well as through several quantitative research rounds, was a personalized plan that helps somebody understand where to start. Where do I start now? What's the next step I take in my getting out of debt journey? So I can get this thing out of the way and achieve some life goals that I have, whether that's starting a family or buying a house, et cetera. So again, Nimble gives you a personalized plan and then it helps you with some spend guidance along the way um, so that as things change throughout your month, uh, throughout the, your execution, uh, it, you know, you, the application can uh, change with you and keep you on track and help you ultimately accomplish that goal of getting out of debt. So just, um, just a quick uh, note, since we do have uh, an international audience, Phil, I do know that uh, nationwide, as a general rule, we're a Fortune 75, so we're a, a really large company, but we do business in the U.S. We currently do not do business outside of the U.S. Um, is Nimble a product that is uh, available outside of the U.S., or is it a U.S.-only product at this point? Nimble is available uh, for U.S. only at this time. Great. So, Great. Apologies to all the international folks, but uh, uh, perhaps down the road we'll, we'll make this available in your country as well. That's right, absolutely. Yeah, so um, spoke about this earlier, uh, but the uh, the overlay here with the uh, circle at right, you can see um, the actual IT for IT capability mapping here on the left. Um, really, uh, when you think about the founder context where you've either got a couple of founders or a, a high autonomy uh, R&D team, that's really what we were. We were a high autonomy R&D team trying to put uh, concepts in front of people that uh, met the need of, uh, you know, in, in the case of a financial application, there's a lot of complexity associated with these numbers. And we felt that we needed to put um, somebody's uh, own numbers in front of them to really test the, the learnings, uh, which requires working software. You can't do that with a sketch uh, low fidelity prototype. Uh, but the minimum amount of uh, technology we needed to bring to bear was, you know, what you see here, uh, highlighted in, in these uh, in the founder context capability mapping. Uh, configuration management, bottom right, we got that free from the cloud. I didn't have to spend a lot of time there. And then uh, just writing these prototypes, you can see in the source control build and build packaging components um, being relevant for us in this context. Yeah, I think one one point that's important to mention here, Phil, as we, as we look at a picture like this, is that uh, from a from a perspective of this being the blueprint of our digital enterprise, um, 
the way I think about these boxes, uh, which are the, the components of the IT tool chain, or the, the circles, which is the data flowing between the different steps, um, everything on this chart is still relevant, even in the prototyping stage. But the difference really is whether you are using tools and formalizing these things, or whether maybe you're doing these things in an informal way, maybe you're doing them in your head, or by swiveling your chair around and talking to the other folks on the team. So I always like to use the enterprise architecture component as an example here. Even in the smallest digital product, you have an architecture component that you have to think through. You're just thinking through it in your head. You don't have to write it down because your team is small. You're able to articulate in that in conversations. Um, whereas when it comes to uh, managing your source control, you got to have systems to do that even at the earliest stages. Is that kind of how you see it as well, Phil? Yeah, absolutely. Another great example right above source control is requirement component. I think it's built without requirements, right? So to your point, uh, you know, very small, um, you know, autonomous team working through requirements in person together, right? Um, Co-located with the development staff and uh, handing them requirements, but we just didn't have a system with the requirements capability operationalized, um, you know, with, you know, one of the common systems that we use today. So that's a, uh, yeah, it's a great clarifying point. So how did that start to change as you got your innovation case approved and you moved into the next stage, Phil? Well, the, the real key there for us was, um, and I'll go ahead and go to that. Um, we had to get a lot more systematic about managing our requirements and managing our quality and, and starting doing some test automation. Um, fulfillment execution component, that becomes critically important for us so that we can actually start uh, testing our digital products on Android and um, iOS handsets. The way we do that is through Google Play or um, Apple iTunes from a film and execution per perspective. Uh, you can't do those things without making them systematized or you know, engaging with these uh, in a more deliberate way. Um, so yeah, I mean, again, um, from a retrospective perspective, I think these are, um, these are the sort of the minimum things that we would have needed uh, to consider going into the actual develop and launch post innovation case. And it really would have helped us <laughs> focus our efforts in these different domains had we had this when we were going through it. Great. So, yeah. so then how about as you moved on to the next stage? Yeah, so get it, as we traverse through our, our development and got closer to launch in December, um, things just, you know, continue to increase in complexity. Um, you have to get a lot more deliberate about actually managing the effort with project management and program management fundamentals. Um, it, for us, since this was a brand new company or a brand new experience for Nationwide, we didn't have the business operational side in play. We didn't have uh, bank partnerships for the, the digital product that we were building in Nimble. Uh, there are bank partnerships required. Uh, we didn't have any of the business uh, deployed. So there really was a program with multiple work streams to manage. You can't do that um, with hallway conversations. There's a growth marketing capability. A lot of that um, you know, program and project management and portfolio demand component come into play. Um, yeah, and then obviously you, you want to make sure that as you're delivering a beta to the market, you've got the problem and incident components uh, ready to start uh, addressing issues as they as they present themselves with your users. Um, and so a uh, team of teams, especially in our geographically dispersed uh, situation that we have, is a, is a nice way to think about uh, executing and managing on that. And so you know, when we launch a new company like this, Nimble, even though it says by Nationwide, that's kind of in small print. Uh, one yep. of the big, you know, when people are going to get involved in an application like this from a company they may or may not, or especially from a company they don't know or doesn't carry a big brand, talk a little bit about trust and, and some of the cybersecurity type uh, protocols we put in place. Sure. Yeah. So uh, Nimble, I, I didn't mention this piece of it, but uh, for those of you who do try it, you'll be asked uh, early in the 
setup process to connect your bank accounts. And uh, we know uh, from live and market feedback as well as uh, our qualitative and quantitative tests, we know that people will hesitate to do that because uh, they feel as though uh, that's highly sensitive information. And so to just give that to application ABC, uh, that's something that they're going to hesitate to do. We also know that Nationwide is one of the most trusted brands uh, in the US uh, it, with uh, global recognition. And uh, that, that brand, that co-brand being there um, suggests that we can be trusted. Um, I will tell you, we, we can be trusted, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> but um, <laughs> uh, when it comes to the actual security in place, um, we use bank level encryption. Um, all of our, uh, you know, we're looking at encrypting all of our data at rest, all of our data in um, motion is all encrypted. So, um, yeah, um, I, you know, we are a very, uh, we are critically focused on security because we know our users demand it. And we talk a lot about that throughout the experience. Um, we also were able to partner with the, uh, the nationwide cybersecurity uh, team to uh, perform an attack and penetration test prior to launch, full-scale attack and penetration test. I will tell you that um, one of the things that came out of that was a very excited uh, fintech partner that we were working with who called us one day and said, hey, uh, so we're seeing a lot of really strange-looking activity coming from nationwide. <laughs> And so what had happened is the uh, attack and penetration test started hammering one of our partners because it was exposed in the app. And um, it, was, uh, it, it was a useful uh, for output of that a and test because uh, what seemed like it shouldn't have been a huge amount of traffic was actually uh, impacting their production system. Uh, so that was, that, was nice to, uh, that was nice to get that feedback and say, hey guys, maybe, maybe it might be a good idea to um, update your system so that we can scale a little bit more effectively. Sure, yeah, the enterprise context will be one that's very familiar and comfortable to Nationwide, but something that we aren't um, implementing yet uh, for Nimble. We are bringing some of the contexts in, in the enterprise context. Yeah, so it's the next slide there. Um, so, you know, this is really where um, some of the risk management and other enterprise architecture and other, um, you know, uh, other other of these capabilities come into play. Um, again, nationwide business units that are going concerned business units um, implement these today. And uh, a lot of people that come and ask, well, how is Nimble doing this or that? Uh, they really are relevant here. Um, and when we are finished executing our learning plan for Nimble, which our learning plan is, does this thing that we built actually solve the needs that we thought it would? Can we make money at this thing? And can we actually require, uh, can, excuse me, can we acquire customers viably? Um, so uh, that is the focus of our learning plan today. Once that learning plan is finished, uh, once we're done answering those questions, uh, we'll make a decision on whether or not we want to sort of move out of this dev and launch uh, early launch stage and into more of a incubate and scale phase. Um, so far, things are going well for, for Nimble. Um, we still have a few things that we haven't learned that we need to learn uh, around the business viability. But, um, you know, this is what I would assume will be coming our way in the next, you know, six to 12 months for Nimble. Great. Now, before we switch over to key learnings, I did want to throw out a couple of questions we got from the audience today for our podcast. Um, so the there's one from Samir talking about POCs. Is there a POC between the stages of Explore and design and develop and launch. Uh, I think you kind of addressed that. Do you you made how, how do you handle POCs? Yeah. Um, so our POCs again are um, primarily created in order to test with small groups of participants in field research. Um, in the case of Nimble, and I, I'll be careful that I don't go too long on this one because I could say a lot. But in the case of Nimble. We continued our detailed design uh, user research work until about June or July of 2019. And Devin, our Devon launch phase had started in April. So um, the way it, in our case, the way we use proof of concepts or POCs is uh, we put these concepts in front of consumers and we say, if we had a thing like this, how 
how would this help you or would it help you? And we use that, uh, we use learnings from showing POCs to users like that to um, make our product even better. And Mike, real quick, on some of the other uh, innovation uh, startups that we're doing at Nationwide, we do do proof of concepts, especially on companies that we're looking at uh, partnering or integrating with to validate technology. Yeah, one, right. more, one more quick thing on the POCs for Nimble. When people are dealing with finances, uh, a lot of folks, um, especially folks who have big debt situations, have learned, um, again, this is something we've learned through research, people have learned to sort of not want to get into the details on the numbers. And when we show numbers to them that are sort of example numbers or made up in a low fidelity prototype, they kind of glaze over and any learnings you could have gotten um, are sort of out the door. So that's where we had a strong need to put people's own numbers in front of them. So that's another point on the POC side where it was particularly important for Nimble to be able to show people their own numbers. Yeah, absolutely. And then one more question I'm going to hit really quickly uh, before we transition over to the learning slide. Uh, there's a question around uh, the first phase of pods uh, and the second phase of teams. Uh, and maybe I'll address that really quickly. In Explore and Design, we do call our, our teams pods there. Uh, those pods stay together across multiple innovation initiatives. Once we hit an innovation case, um, we fund a specific innovation initiative going forward, and then we stand up and call those teams. And so there is uh, a little bit of nomenclature difference, um, and, and it is intentional uh, as we kind of think about how we navigate the organization. Um, with that, I know we're running quickly out of time, so maybe we can hit on a couple of key learnings, Phil, and then we'll hit the rest sure. of the questions in Q&A uh, afterwards with Dave. Sure. Um, I, I think I've spoken to a lot of these, um, but uh, we've talked about prototypes in the founder context, um, especially in a company uh, the size of Nationwide. It's a nice, uh, it's a nice way to do some low fidelity testing in market um, with the fidelity required, I guess. Um, the uh, yeah, we we definitely felt this the second one where um, we used the nationwide brand. We talked about that, which required us to pull some legal and compliance and other particular you know brand management topics forward from context three and four uh, earlier in the process. Um, yeah, and again, um, we had more folks at nationwide trying to pull us directly to enterprise uh, because that's the world that we execute in most days. Um, and so having, again, this is where I talked about having this, this blueprint, uh, the IT for IT blueprint to refer back to uh, becomes a, uh, a valuable tool just to help manage those conversations and when people are actually pulling you in one direction or another. Um, and yeah, that last, <laughs> that last point sort of is uh, obvious, but I really would have uh, appreciated being able to map our work to these, uh, the IT for IT, as well as the emergence model. Um, had we had it when we started. Yeah, we kind of picked it up in the middle and and yep. used it both going forward um, yep. in the in the launch and, and accelerate phase, but then we looked at it retrospectively and, and saw it fit really well with the experience that we had, right? Absolutely. So the the one other learning that we didn't mention but you mentioned here in your presentation today, Phil um, that I do think it's worth reiterating and highlighting, right? This is a different way of, of doing development, right? From what we have historically done. The way I like to, to think about it is um, in, this, in this new digital world, we're doing R&D, not engineering, right? And uh, we need a different set of processes, a different approach, a different way of thinking that's much more experiential or experimental uh, to developing products and, and determining and finding out requirements versus historically when we uh, think about project, projects in a waterfall perspective, we defined all of our requirements up front before we did the build. And so I think this is a very, very different way of building, in, uh, building out an IT product. And I think the digital world is, uh, it's increasingly relevant to, to be able to do things like this. Yep, absolutely, totally agree. All right, well, with that, I think we are out of time, so I'll turn it back over to our friends over at the Open Group. Thanks, everyone, for uh, joining us on our on our podcast today. Uh, Paul, any last 
comments as our as my co-host. No, thanks a lot, Joel. Uh, great job as always, and we appreciate everyone taking their time today to kind of listen a little bit about our journey. And uh, oh, I got one. back to you, Steve. You. Nice job, gentlemen. Th thanks, Phil, Mike, and, and Paul, for that. We we have a lot of questions that have come in. I know you tackled a couple of them, but um, it's great great to hear the use of, uh, of some of our standards uh, for real in uh, in an organization like Nationwide. So um, uh, really really great to hear. So um, a number of questions. Now you 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 talked about your map versus your MVP, but the, the first question relates to that, which is. MVP is mandatory but not sufficient. Uh, the Open Group AA, uh, Agile Architecture Framework and also Gartner recommend also using MVA, Minimum Value Architecture. How are you addressing this point? For example, a single MVA and multiple MVPs sharing the same architecture? That's a good question. Um, I think uh, the way we, uh, the, so I, I guess I'll, I'll answer this um, in a roundabout fashion that may not be satisfactory to the person who answered who asked the question. But um, when we think about MVP versus MAP, uh, the focus is less on the um, the architecture that's a, a solid foundation for multiple um, MVPs, which I think is what the question is getting to, um, and, and it's more around um, you know something that just satisfies a need without any uh, points of delight. Uh, it's, it's more of a user focused, uh, do something in addition to serving the need to delight the user and make them want to return to your product. Now, from an architectural perspective, we've certainly built this in a, um, a cloud native way uh, using a serverless architecture so that uh, we, we believe that we've uh, built this with a, uh, an MVA, I think is the term that you use, um, that is extensible and, and uh, can we can deliver additional capabilities and products using this architecture. Uh, but uh, in the MVP to MAP pivot that our chief innovation officer, Scott Sanchez, uh, encourages us to, to use, it's less about uh, the technology architecture underpinning the solution and more about the, uh, the way we solve the need, if that makes sense. Right. Yeah, so maybe, Paul, uh, you can talk just a little bit about the, the innovation platform that you're you're working on because I think that really kind of fits this concept of MVA um, and and how we're planning on addressing architecture across multiple products yeah so first thing we want to do is I know there was a question somewhere in there around our kind of our enterprise architecture mm -hmm. from an innovation standpoint we don't want to stifle innovation by too many rules of address so uh, uh, at nationwide like I said we're very, very large company and in our cloud plat in our cloud uh, uh, platforms and our other uh, various ar architectures throughout we have pretty strict ish guidelines on where we have to be within these guardrails with innovation we're, we're creating a platform that allows us to go outside those bounds uh, so we can try things we don't want to be slowed down or hindered by those uh, now we do have we still have to go through our, our security protocols and we have a sec deck up Sec DevOps team that goes through, make sure we're not breaching any data, data privacy, attack and penetration, things like that. Mm -hmm. Outside of that, we leave a lot of freedom. So what we what we're doing is essentially uh, basically using a cloud you know, cloud native platform, kind of outside the nation. We're using AWS in this case, but outside of the nationwide AWS until our until our own. It's kind of really pretty open, like a startup might do. Uh, and then and layering in common components that we use, like a billing component or something like this, that's not an internal nationwide billing component, uh, so we can move fast. And also, so there's security, there's also a lot of MarTech tools that we look at a little bit differently nationwide as we're trying to in, in, introduce something new to the market and learn to see if it's a viable business. The last thing we want to do is over-invest on an application to make sure it can scale to a zillion users if it's something that we're going to test in the market and then end up throwing away. So uh, in this, you know, we do want to, if we're going to fail, we want to fail fast and fail as cheaply, as, you know, within a reasonable amount of dollars as well. <laughs> Cheap failure. Yeah. Well, on, the, on that, on that point, um, Paul, and another question that came in is in your concept of explore, is that some form of analysis which drives design? Because many companies that fail fast, the failings often because they don't do the analysis and they try and try to transform a story right to code. 
um, yeah. with no analysis and little design. So could you speak to that a bit? Sure. It depends on the complexity of the technology and in, in the in the solution we're building. So Nimble wasn't a super, you know, tech, there wasn't a lot of technic technically complex real deep components there. You know, some of the algorithms and stuff are, but the actual implementation of the technology wasn't. On things where we do have it could be a little trickier, whether that's a, a really detailed machine learning learning components, AI components, or if we're going to integrate with other uh, startups or other companies and we have to validate how their application, will their application meet our needs, the, data, the integrations, and how does it work? We do do design work in front of that. Can Are there open APIs? Can we access those APIs? Do they have proper security? protocols in place on their side if we're going to share data. So we do get into that on, on those types. Right. And I, I know uh, one of you mentioned design thinking as the start. I think it was Mike probably as the, the start of things. But um, so yeah, there's there's probably six to 12 months worth of of analysis that happens leveraging design thinking to your point, Steve, right. up front before we ever write a single line of code. So yes, we do a tremendous amount of analysis and understanding up right. front. So, uh, um, in, interesting question uh, came in. What, what, what if the? Um, let me read this to get it right. Right. What if the nimble solution approach is in conflict with an enterprise architecture thinking before the enterprise phase is started? <laughs> yeah, it's an so interesting question. Go ahead. We, we haven't got there yet. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, I actually I, think it's it's pretty easy, right? So, so. Paul and Phil have done a great job of engaging architecture uh, in the journey, um, even prior to that integration with the broad um, uh, enterprise uh, stage. So I think um, I think it's that's that's a really key piece of it, right? Even if you are not in that enduring enterprise stage, you have to. We, we talked about it. In, in a company like Nationwide, you have to talk to the architects. You have to talk to the security folks. You have to give a little free thought to how you're going to have this thing come together, even if you don't invest in all of the, the tooling uh, mm -hmm. that might go into it behind that. Right. Yeah, because we, we have to put dollars to, when you get to, to your point, to the enterprise phase, or what we're calling scale, where now it's a real asset. We need to make sure the decisions we're making, we understand some of the cost implications that if you want to bring it in later, what it will cost. If those numbers get really high, we may choose uh, different decisions earlier in our in our phases. Uh, but we do look at that, especially on standardized software that we may use at the company that we don't want to use on something like this. And what would that take if we're going to bring this in-house to switch it over? Right. And I think this is a really important nuance for folks to understand. When you think about leveraging DP Bach and the emergence model in the context of an existing enterprise, a big company like a nationwide, the way that you leverage it is thinking about your new products as digital products and then thinking about it as you integrate with the broader enterprise. And so each of those products needs their own tool chain, their own way of thinking about it and going through this progression as it, as it grows. That's very different than if you're starting a company all on its own um, as a startup, right? If you're starting a company as a startup, following that DP, DP Bach progression, you can do that almost pretty pure, right? Mm -hmm. But in an enterprise, you have to have some other constructs to, to consider and, and take advantage of. Right. Steve, I think if I can add on to that a little bit, one of the things that's being given a lot of consideration at the in the architecture group is in fact that kind of mapping that you saw for IT for IT applying to architecture because as as Michael just pointed out you know everybody needs some architecture whether it's the thing you do on your whiteboard with the guy you're sitting next to or um, or something that's more complex that you've inherited from your organization you do need to have it and particularly people shouldn't confuse the scaling model of you know I only need to do what's necessary at my own scale. It's got to help you with your transition to the next the next level as well. And that's where architecture really kicks in is that that planning for what happens when you succeed. How do you move up in the world? Right. Okay. 
All right, gentlemen, we we are out of time. I just uh, Dave, now as you're speaking, um, I know you answered this in the uh, in the Q and A chat, but there was there was uh, interest around uh, how are we rolling out TOGAF training and certification. Can you just say a, a few short words on that? Well, I, well, I think uh, you know uh, we've got uh, plenty of material on TOGAF training and certification. I think. Um, for uh, DP Bach, we do have a training and certification program also, as we do for all of our standards. And so um, uh, I, I put the link in the, in the Q&A, I think is the best thing. Go to that page. We do have a presenter, uh, excuse me, a, a training ecosystem. We've got a couple of trainers who are actively doing it and those are growing. We're looking at how to do more online because of course people you know, can't get face-to-face -face and attend training sessions. So our, our certification team is looking at that. And I believe we've got some uh, university training going on. I, there's this guy named Mike Fulton who's got a really good course that he uh, talks about a lot on LinkedIn. So um, uh, we're looking for more of that yeah. as well. Okay, great. Thanks for the plug, Dave. Yeah, nice, nice plug there. So um, another presentation for another day. Yeah, exactly. <laughs>